This is War Room Moments, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and most relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they have learned on their road to success and get exclusive advice on how to implement their success into your life and business. War Room Moments is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board. Here's your host, Jason Miller. Hey, welcome to the War Room, Damien. I always love having, you know, fellow veterans and service members. That's my heart, obviously. And uh, thanks for being on the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, a- a- as you may or may not know, the the War Room was created around business as war, and that stems from years of service, so on and so forth. Um, so we get to honor that today. I. You know, I have a lot of veterans on the show, but not as many as I'd like to. Um, So it's great to have you here. And I would love for you, because I just, I'm shit at introducing people. I'll just, just be honest, right? Um, (laughs) Know your faults. Um, So so just, just take 30 seconds to introduce yourself and what your superpowers are, man. Yeah. So I'm somebody with a unnatural obsession with the science of identity. Uh, and I've tried to kick it. I've tried to get rid of it. It's the addiction that won't go away. Uh, and you know, over a, over a couple of gin and tonics, you can get me talking about where it comes from and why that (laughs) happened. But ultimately I love to apply that out in the business world. And I've done it through a number of different vehicles and businesses over the years. Um, and I really operate at the intersection of where business meets people. Uh, and I think we tend to imagine businesses as mechanisms, and I like to help us remember it's actually people that we're dealing with on the other side and, and mm. how to do that. Yeah. I always say meet people where they are, not where you That's want right. them to go. Sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's where the success actually happens. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I built a career around it for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no doubt. Well, awesome. Well, hey, I'm curious. As, as we kind of kick the conversation off here, you know, I know you're in the military, you were in the air force, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but let's rewind that clock. Mm. Did you come from a family of entrepreneurs? Well, that's actually really interesting. Um, actually I, I did. And I didn't, I think mm. both of my parents really wished they were entrepreneurs, uh, but I was the youngest of eight kids. And so there wasn't a lot of room for risk taking. Uh, both my parents just kind of worked and and did their best to provide for the family, but they were constantly talking to me about business ideas. Um, and, and I've, you know, I'm the youngest. And so my older siblings were often talking about those business ideas too. And so I kind of feel like I grew up listening to everyone talk about business ideas and feeling like, why isn't anyone doing this? Uh, and so from a really young age, I started applying what I was learning from everybody else. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it always interests me when you start talking about the dynamic of, you know, I call it high performance, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, military is very high performance. Sports is very high performance. All those different things are very high performance. And when you look at success rates from those, they always, not always, but they seem to stem back to some boiling point in the past, right? Sure. And, you know, that boiling point for me, because I, I mean, I joined the military young and did 23 years, but my parents were both entrepreneurial. Mm. My dad ran a farm and my mom had two or three businesses in town. I mean, I grew up in a small town of like 500 people. So um, my mom, I always call her the first blockbuster. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, so I I came in the military and I just had the bug is what it was. Mm. And then it was real estate. Everybody was doing real estate. But so I'm just curious, what was that bug I mean, was there a bug there for you too? Um, Yeah, I think part of it comes from need, right? So being the youngest of eight kids, like we really mm. didn't have a lot. And so all my siblings were kind of, we kind of were more of like a wolf pack. It was like everybody was on their own and uh, we all needed something to kind of uh, 
get by and, and get our piece of the pie. And, and so my, you know, my, I've got three brothers and then four sisters and then me. And so my three brothers, they're nine, 10 and 11 years older than me. And I grew up in Silicon Valley. So that also part of that story. Um, but my brothers were, you know, in the thick of it in their, you know, late teens, early twenties during the dot com boom, working with other companies and friends starting businesses. And they were like, Hey, my brother can, can get us design work for cheap or free. And so that's kind of like how that, how that began for me, uh, is doing design work for my siblings, friends, but also just in general, I, I could tell you stories of like selling, you know, arbitrage, getting arbitrage on, on beef jerky in, at school in, in second and third grade, right. <laughs> sure. Running, running a, a poker, poker, uh, game with my friends in fourth grade. And, uh, I somehow figured out real fast, like, oh, nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, but my brothers had taught me to play. So I knew what I was doing. And so I knew how to, how to kind of, uh, have everybody have fun. They were basically paying to play. Um, and so there was always a mindset around how can I make money? Um, and then that kind of fell into it, uh, as I hit my teens during the dot com boom. Yeah. I mean, it's a theme, man. It is a theme of not, I mean, it's not like it's a blanket statement, but a lot of people that run successful, not hobby shit. I'm talking people that run like successful companies today. They were your lemonade stand runners. They were, you know, upcharging the chocolate bars that you sold as a kid. Totally. <laughs> Taking 25 cents extra off the back end of it. Right. I did that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or the, the popcorn sales or whatever. Right. But you start, you look at like a lot of successful business owners, you know, I mean, there's some roots into a lot of that stuff. And, you know, I always say, I, I personally think that the human race was designed to be entrepreneurial. Sure. I mean, think about it. We're spoiled now. We don't have to go hunt. We go to a grocery store, right? But let's go back to caveman brain. And you had to hunt for food, all those things. It yeah. didn't get much more entrepreneurial than that, right? And then life got easier and easier and easier, and we fell into new things, and that's a whole nother episode. But, <laughs> but, but. yeah, you know, I think I, I agree with you. I think ultimately this this mindset of of acquiring resources and and uh it is really natural and certainly um you know that's that's why i think you find it in a lot of stories where where there was some kind of need um mm -hmm. is cuz that's where we find that that desire that that push that's natural in us to go acquire resources when they're just handed to you we lose that kind of natural piece of us and and a lot of people find another way to get back in touch with it uh, but it was certainly <laughs> need need lit that fire for me, and it was there was something in what you said that made me realize something I'd never thought about my story before. Is that and now I work largely in brand, um, and I, I kind of started in design, and that grew into marketing, and then and then eventually I recognized what I was doing all along was really focused on brand. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing that, like arbitrage on beef jerky in like second grade, at first I was trying to undercut like what you could get it from like the school store or from the Seven Eleven, and, and I was charging less mm. and that was fine. And then I realized that, uh, when I could tell a good story about it, people would buy it and buy more of it. And, and, and really quickly I realized like, Oh, not only will they buy more of it, but I can charge more. And so pretty quickly I was charging more than, you know, you could get at Seven Eleven. Um, and it was really just about the story of why of or how I came by it or how I was why I was selling it um, and and doing that to my friends and and ultimately, you know, was able to get a lot of their their lunch money out of their pockets to, <laughs> to uh, on the basis of a good story, which is it's yeah. funny. I had never thought about that. I had I didn't remember that until uh, until you you were saying something. And, and I realized like, oh, actually, that's that's how I ended up. It's not that different than what I'm doing now. Uh, I kind of found something that worked for me and, and kept at it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you're familiar with cone communication studies or not, but but and I don't know when this was, what year it was, but um, it was a study on millennial moms. 
right? Mm. And it was a study that millennial moms will brand jump if there's a cause attached to it. Mm -hmm. So let's say puppy chow, right? Puppy chow doesn't, I don't know if they do or not disclosure, right? Sure. (laughs) But puppy chow doesn't have a, say puppy chow doesn't have a, a cause behind it, right? But the other brand does and they support puppies in Afghanistan, right? Mm-hmm. The millennial mom will jump from puppy chow to the other brand only because it has a cause attached to it. Sure. And what's great about that is that's actually like the tip of the iceberg on mm. things like this. Yeah. One of the things that one way that we could can phrase that is to say that people uh, and it's it's most concentrated in millennial moms, so it's easier to see. Mm-hmm. But they'll they'll show a preference for a product or a company based on whether or not it aligns with their values, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. And and so what we call that is like an ethical appeal. And and the most obvious, kind of the tip of the iceberg, is something that is like we feel like is ethically good, but also like. An, an ethical appeal can be anything that just aligns with who you know yourself to be. So as you and I both know, there's things in the military identity that isn't necessarily good, right? Yeah. Black Rifle Coffee, I think, like capitalized on this really well, right? They took things that outsiders might view as negative, but it's so tied to the identity right? That then people prefer that brand. And so these are like really obvious ways to do it. And what I love to do is say, Ooh, if millennial moms will will switch a brand for a cause or or veterans will buy black rifle coffee because it aligns with their identity, what are like the really subtle ways of being able to do the same thing? And that's kind mm. of the the sandbox that I play in. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on that? I mean, what is if if there were you know a little piece of that that you've seen throughout the market that's uh kind of across niches right it's it's Mm -hmm. agnostic Mm -hmm. in that you know what are the things that you see there that are brand agnostic yeah so i i think when we when we stop thinking of a brand i think a lot of people think of brands as as like a a reputation like when Mm -hmm. when they think about brands they're buying they think about the identity does this resonate with me Is it aligned with who I am? Do I like that? When they think about their own brand, they think about a reputation. And what we end up doing in that is we like create what what Carl Jung called the mask, right? We we create this false self that also like in reality is really hard to connect to. Whether we're talking about sales or just creating a relationship, which most sales are a byproduct of a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. That, That mask, that fake self gets in the way of the relationship. And so what I think, what I try to help people do is find that authentic identity, find what's real there. And then find the, the, the appropriate way to get people to connect to that. And so like ultimately a brand is a form of collective identity. And so when you think about what it means to be American, and they're like there's there's core ideas and beliefs that that you have, and there are core ideas and beliefs that are common to most people. And then there's symbols of that, right? So you have like the flag, and you have Uncle Sam. You have all these different assets that tr- start to portray that. And so when you think of a brand from that aspect, then it opens up a lot of really interesting doors. We're not just creating something that people can identify with and connect to you're creating something that influences who they are, right? They're, when yeah. I buy an Apple product, it means something to me about who I am to to, to buy that, right? And that's why people pay more and, and pay more often. But I think we can in, intentionally design in any brand, like, ooh, if I think of this less like a reputation or a, or a, a, a marketing stunt, if I think about this as like a community that I'm creating, a club that I'm creating, mm-hmm. what does it mean to be a part of this club? And then walking around with my product is is a badge that I'm a member of that club. And what does that say? And I think really deeply defining that, uh, we found, you know, my my whole career has been about using that to drive sales and and drive adoption in ways that are are genuinely uh, more healthy, right? We're helping people express themselves better. Uh, I think when you do kind of black hat 
brand tactics. Uh, I and I would I would say you know, I would I would call them reputation hacks uh, as as uh, distinct from real brand strategy. But when when we engage in that type of things, they're they're really short lived mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't root itself in the identity and it doesn't live on uh, beyond one or two transactions. Yeah, I call that the hoo ha effect. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, all businesses do the PR things, sure. and yada, yada, yada. That's kind of part of it. But, but when, when that's all you identify with is that's what I call it. It's the hoo-ha effect, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of, you know, you know, confetti throwing it all the time. It's like, Let's just keep throwing confetti. Eventually somebody is going to go, oh, well, those guys are cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> Instead of, you know, one of my core beliefs is lead with value and lead with value for as long as it takes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's one of my core values of my companies um, is that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand this damn concept of, you know, let's be authentic. Well, holy shit. If you can't be authentic. Yeah. Right. I mean, you need to step back and just take a look at that because right. that's a conversation we shouldn't even have to have. That's right. <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> no, but unfortunately, I mean, the industry, especially for the last 50 years has told people that it's about, I, you know, I actually really dislike this idea of being customer obsessed. Right. Mm. And I think what, when, when done right, it's what you're talking about. We're like, just lead with value and, mm. and deliver value for as long as it takes. Right. Uh, the problem is when we, people mistake this idea of being customer obsessed in that be whoever people want you to be. And, th and then businesses have spent 50 years or more, like just faking it being who people want them to be. And now as entrepreneurship has kind of democratized and it's more common, you have lots of people that are just starting out that think, oh, okay, well, to be customer obsessed, that means I just got to be whoever they want me to be. And that's where I think like, I 100% agree with you. If we're having the conversation of be authentic, we got problems, right? But I think like, unfortunately, the, the there, there's this like false idea has been preached out there into the entrepreneurial world where people think, no, 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 abandon yourself, abandon your authenticity and be who people want you to be in order to close sales. And it's like, look, that doesn't work for making friends. That doesn't work for finding a wife. So what makes you think it works in creating business relationships? It doesn't. It's terrible mm -hmm. advice. The thing is, is take a step back, be your authentic self again and show up with that every day in your business. Uh, and, and sales will happen. Sales will come. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know where that, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it, you know, but then you, you flip that coin. Right. And here's the other side. I seen a post the other day on LinkedIn and they were, you know, complaining about getting sold on DMS and all this stuff mm -hmm. and yada, yada, yada. Right. And, and look, I, I don't like it either. I'm not saying yeah. I don't like it either. But people complain about it, and then they do the same exact bullshit themselves, sure. right? Of yeah. And, and and instead of, and I don't like the approach of a lot of these companies, but but look, that it tells you a story too, right? Sure. And that story that they're telling you is, look, I'm desperate, <laughs> and I'm looking to close, and I'm gonna just blanket everybody on any channel I can. And yep. some sucker's going to say yes. Sure. Right. Because math never lies. A percentage of people will go, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Right. Yeah. Um, so you can't hate on them for it either. Sure. Um, and I well, don't like it. And it's not my approach. But that's right. I mean, there's one, it's one way of doing things. And I think uh, for me, I'm lazy. And so the economics on that are <laughs> terrible. Right. Yeah, right. I, I don't want to reach out to 2000 people to get the one, maybe, and 15 people, you know, telling me off. Right. right. I, I'd rather just spend the, the, the time developing a relationship with five people that really get to know me. And, and they're like, man, I love what you're doing and how can we work together? And that's just a much more satisfying way to me to do business. It's, it's a proven thing. Yeah. I mean, when you, you know, that that's why I, you know, I'm kind of Zoom uh, averse nowadays and I love to just 
if, if somebody calls me and says, look, you know, I would love to work with you. Can we hop on? No, but I'll hop on a plane. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> and I'll come out and see you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And fly out there, see him, spend a couple days with him, get into the weeds with him a little bit. And now you've won a lifetime customer. Right. Totally. And, and there's so much value in that. And most of my customers are pretty good friends too. And it, it, it's yeah. hard not to become that way. Right. Um, and I did lots of business, you know, when I was younger that, that, I mean, a lot of these things I've, I've been in the business for a long time. Right. So, so I, I learned these things through experience sure. and uh, even when uh, I found somebody will pay more money, right. Enterprise uh, clients pay a lot more money. Mm. Um but I also recognize that a lot of them are are further removed from the problem. And so because it they don't care about the problem as much, they like they don't care about you solving it as much. Whereas I really right. like working with business owners, founders, entrepreneurs, because when I'm solving a problem for them, it means something to them. And so we get better right. answers. We get, you know, the brainstorming is like more creative because it actually means something to solve this. And so over time, we're making we're we're closing deals that were higher ticket, but we're mm -hmm. keeping less of the money because it was like such a grind to get it done because nobody really cared about the problem. And so it's like, you know, one person throws in their two cents here and then a week later, the big boss changes the direction completely because nobody really cares about what's going on. Right. Whereas yeah. when you're working with founders, entrepreneurs, business owners, like everybody cares, including myself and my team about, you know, getting led down range and being as effective as possible. Right. Yeah. 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 It's not just a tax write off. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> which Sometimes we all know, <laughs> which we all know that's the big companies, right? That's like, right. I mean, look at D and I, I mean, we could go on. That's a whole nother segment too. But, sure. Yeah. But now look at that. That's like, everybody's trying to take that behind the barn and put a bullet in its head now. Right. right? So it's like, but why did we go there to begin with? Sure. Right. Cause it was a fad thing. Right. right? Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. That's just how it works, I guess. But you know, but you and I didn't need to deal with it. Right. I, I could have, I mean, honestly, I could have gave two shits of less about D and I not for the, not for the reason of what it was for, but for the reason of what it became. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you know? and <laughs> it's great that we tried to try to solve a solution in a particular way. And I think pretty quickly people saw like, oh, this is, this is actually not the best way to solve the, the, the my first experience with it actually um, was, was at a, a company that I used to work for and they brought somebody in and hired somebody over it. And, uh, and then completely disempowered that person. They were basically like a token hire and then had <laughs> like white dudes making all the decisions for that. And it was like, well, this is like a, a total mistake, right? It's, it's missing the point anyway. And, and yeah, I don't have a, a DEI department. I just make sure that in my thinking, I like diverse modes of thought, right? I, especially mm -hmm. what I do is very creative. I can't have uh, over, over any metric. I can't have a bunch of people that just think that the same. Uh, because otherwise, you know, we're coming up with very narrow ideas. Uh, I need a broad right. spectrum of ideas. And that comes from working with people from a broad spectrum of backgrounds and, That's and, right. uh, cultures and influences. And, and I love that. I think it makes our team better. Kind of sounds like the military. That's right. Yeah. No kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, th that's one of the things I loved the most about the military is really quickly. I was like best friends with people I would not have ever spoken to, uh, without joining the military, yeah. like the pe people who I thought I had, you know, ingrained beliefs and ideas and, and even, you know, dislikes for, and then, and then it's like, you're just hanging with them, working with them every day. And you're like, Oh, actually this guy's really cool. <laughs> yeah. And weird people. I mean, yeah, I remember yeah, when absolutely. I first, when I first went into the military, I, we had this, he drove a damn hearse to work every day <laughs> in his, sure. before he joined the mill, it was a hearse. And on the back window, it had a big alien head Nice. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he drove this thing to work every day. And he was an undertaker before he joined the military. Right. Oh, that's so wild. it's like, I mean, I guess there wasn't enough money in 
undertaken. Yeah. <laughs> but but just the just weird stuff, right? Sure. And I had another guy that came in. He used to freaking steal gas out of cars and grew up in the Bronx and, mm. you know, just total opposite of where I came from. Right. Sure. Yeah. But you found a common bond. That's right. Yeah. Know? And that was, that's the cool thing about the military, but oh, I, dig- yeah. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, I, I'm really curious on, you know, what are some if if you had to if you had to give a young founder out there that's listening to this when it publishes, you know, two or three pieces of key advice. What what would you tell them? Yeah, so I think um, measure twice and cut once, right? And mm. and I think there's a lot of especially in the last 10, 15 years. Um, a lot of people really have romanticized this idea of move fast and break things. Mm. And, uh, I'm actually a big fan of slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Um, and so I think, look, don't measure 15 times and never cut, right? Like measure twice and cut once, right? Take the time to get things right the first time and then move through. And, and that's that idea about slow is smooth and smooth is fast. If, if, if people aren't familiar with it, the idea is, you know, when I'm trying to move too fast, I'm tripping over things and I'm I'm missing something. I'm I'm driving too fast. I'm I'm not paying attention and I missed my exit. Now I'm gonna have to loop back around. It's gonna take me even longer than it was gonna in the first place. If I'm actually operating smoothly, I've got my head, my wits about me, my head on a swivel, I'm looking around, I'm not gonna miss that exit. Mm-hmm. And so move just uh fast enough that you can still move smoothly. And that way you'll get things done right in the first place. Um, I, th- I, th- I think there's also like an over-focus in, in kind of tactics uh, in the startup world. And and because of that, there's kind of this belief that strategy doesn't matter. Um, or I actually, to be honest with you, I see a lot of kind of like these micro-influencers saying stuff like, what is strategy? Strategy is bullshit. And it's like, <laughs> it's not bullshit. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> there, there's right? a great... There's a great, uh, and anybody in the military is like, what are you talking about? Right? Like you, the military does a great job of showing you the importance of strategy and tactics. Right. And you Mm got to have both. Um, Eisenhower said uh, planning, plans are useless, but planning is essential. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's like sums it my view of strategy up in, in the whole bit that like rarely is the plan that valuable because everything's gonna get screwed up the moment you kind of set things in action. But the act of planning makes you more aware of all the different pieces, all the different variables in the environment and and create kind of mental models for what I could do if something pops up. So creating some kind of strategy around what you're trying to do and getting really clear on that and then allowing that to inform tactics, because unfortunately, I see a lot of young founders, uh, and by young, I mean uh, young in their entrepreneurial journey, right? They could be mm-hmm. 60, um, and if they're a new founder, I'm, that's who I'm talking about. What they do is is they're just, let me execute, 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 put out this fire, put out that fire, but nothing is connected and so mm-hmm. it's just wildly inefficient. And so I'm trying to actually create tools, at least from the lens that I work through uh, on the brand side, to help um, founders and 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 entrepreneurs be more strategic, more coordinated in their action without kind of overthinking it. Like you don't need some broad battle plan if you're just trying to like sell a widget tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and yeah, I, I think the key the key takeaway from that is, you know, no matter what, when you're starting, yes, do you have to focus on selling your product? Absolutely. But I, t- I coined this term back during, you know, the C word. <laughs> I hate saying the word. Um, back in that time was stop worrying about these broad pivots, right? Mm. Let's micro maneuver. Let's do micro pivoting, right? hundred percent. And that way you can do little micro failures too. That's right. Right. And you can micro fail fast and input strategy really fast that way. That's right. Right. Because at that time, 
And quite honestly, anytime, right? We don't always know what the market wants. Of so, course. So why don't we just micro pivot through it like a snake, right? Yeah, I, I love that. Micro maneuver. You know? uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to, Jace Miller, TM, you know, uh, add that to, <laughs> right, to uh, right. uh, the our communications. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's huge. Um, what we do generally with clients is we'll set a strategy. And, and it used to be, you know, 10 years ago, I'd have people say like, oh, where do you think this industry is going to be in five years? And it was like, huh. You know, it's tough to tell, but let me make a prediction. Now it's like most industries, I have a really hard time telling you where it'll be one year from now. Right. Uh, and so we used to create brand strategies on like a yearly basis. We'd set it for the year and then you just execute against it for a year. We'll revisit next year. And now it's like, that does not work anymore. We work with our clients usually on a month to month basis. And we're looking at, okay, what did we do last week? What's, or what did we do last month? What's changed over the course of the last month? Like what is getting us towards our goals? And this is why strategy is so important is that, you know, making sure that those tactics are, are, you know, each vehicle that you put your tactics into, it's aligned, it's oriented towards the goals that you're trying to achieve. And is it going to get you there? And then month to month, you know, course correcting, looking at, is this being effective towards where we're trying to go? Or are we veering off to the left here and we need to uh, create a new initiative, a new tactic that's going to get us back on course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love military comparisons Yeah, and it's, it's no different than, you know, when I had a rifle company took them out, we, we knew, we knew roughly how long we could fight. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we knew roughly how long we could fight. We knew how many bullets would go this long, so on and so forth. But but there was always those times, right, where you didn't predict correct, quite predict things correctly. Sure. And you had to make a quick pivot, micro mm-hmm. pivot, right? And it's like right. the next thing you know, you're calling in for an airdrop of ammo because, well, shit, you weren't expecting to fight a whole damn village today. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you thought you were just going to go out and shoot a few shitheads, right? That's right. <laughs> And that's why it's important to have that awareness of of mm-hmm. the of the battlefield, of the resources right. available to you, of of the possibilities for getting those resources to you, uh, because then when the time comes, you know what kind of micro maneuver you can make. Right. Uh, but, but you you don't know that if you aren't aware of what's available to you and what's the constraints that you're under. Yeah, that's right. ROE, baby. That's right. <laughs> know your ROE, no matter what. That's right. <laughs> oh man. Well, gosh, what a great conversation, brother. It's been, uh, been a lot of fun. And, uh, how, how do people reach out to you? How do you want people to reach out to you? And yeah. So connect? feel free, uh, Damien Ford with two O's. So it's like the truck with two O's, uh, find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm happy to connect and talk with anybody, uh, and it, whether it's advice or, or trying to do some business and, uh, prism.com. So it's P R I S M O N D E prism. O-N-D-E, uh, prismond.com. Um, ultimately, we've taken the the principles of information operations and applied it to brand strategy. And so, you, you know, you talk about a, a lot of, uh, you know, business is war. Um, what's your business doing on the information landscape? Mm. Uh, that's what that's what we're doing with our business. So. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, I love to, sh- to close out this show with a little bit of a thought provoking question. Um, I don't do a lot of Q and a in the show, but this is one that I love to do. Um, Cause it, it lets us in your brain a little bit. Mm. And, and that is, you know, if you could have invited anybody here today, dead or alive, doesn't matter any point in time in history, who would have you loved to have here and why them? Mm. Um. Okay. So that's, that's very hard to narrow it down. Uh, <laughs> honestly, probably my answer I think would be Edward Bernays. So Edward Bernays is is Freud's nephew. Mm. He's seen as the the godfather of of PR. Um, he kind of created the industry, but most people don't understand like where that came from. Was he was actually like our effectively our minister of propaganda during World War II. And so he really understood his uncle's understanding of psychology. 
But then like, rather than like, you know, it being this like high minded stuff in your mind, he, he figured out directly how to apply this stuff and make it effective and, and not only helped us win the war, but then gave birth to an entire industry. So I'd love to pick his brain. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a new one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a sense. You probably haven't gotten that one before. <laughs> no. I, I've gotten a lot of weird ones, but uh <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, a lot of yeah. good ones too, for yeah. sure. Well, well, Hey, awesome, man. Thank, thanks for stopping by today. I know we, we, anytime I have a good conversation, it always blows over time. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I always say it's, you know, we all have those same one sixty eight every week. Thanks for stopping by here for 40 minutes and, uh, dropping some good value on the, the audience, I'm sure there's a lot to pull out of that. And if not, go back and listen to it. That's for right. sure. So hey, thanks so yeah. much for having me. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Cheers. Thanks for listening to War Room Moments with your host, Jason Miller. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advisement on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we'll see you on the next episode. 